we're seeing in real time the testing laboratory for how to create a perfect authoritarian dystopia. Hi, I'm Isabel Hogal, and this is Borderline. I know I promised you a bit of La La Land last week, but I'm afraid this week is not going to be it. I'm talking to Jeffrey Kane. Jeff is a journalist I met a long time ago, over 10 years ago, in fact, when we were both reporters in Cambodia. But unlike me, he stayed there, stayed in Asia, and became the kind of reporter that I can only hope to become deeply sourced, deeply knowledgeable about not only Cambodia, but also uh, Korea, where he spent a long time, particularly North Korea as well, and China. A long-time listeners of the podcast might remember him on an episode last year about uh, being an American expat in the Trump years. But I'm speaking to him today about his latest book, The Perfect Police State, which came out this summer. This book explores in depth what's happening to the Uyghur population in the western province of Xinjiang in China. The Uyghur, you must have heard about them, though it is shrouded in mystery what's happening to them, are a Muslim minority population in China undergoing severe extreme repression from the Chinese state and the Chinese Communist Party. They live in Xinjiang, which is a western province in Central Asia, with Mongolia to the north, Tibet to the south, Kazakhstan, Tajikistan, and a small border with Afghanistan to the West. Through hours and hours of interviews, as well as travel to the region, for which he had to be discreet, Jeff uh, really lays the picture of what's happening in Xinjiang, as well as what kind of totalitarian state we can expect now when you mix the complete disregard for human rights and personal liberties with a fine-tuned use of technology and AI as it is available today. So this is a really important work of journalism, and I am thrilled and honored to have Jeffrey on the podcast. Here is Jeffrey Kane. I have to tell you, when I picked up your book, I read the first three pages and I had to put it down. Because I was going on holiday and I thought it was going to be the most depressing thing I would ever read. And I wasn't ready for it. And just the first three pages are terrifying. Um, the, the prologue, the day in the life of a Uyghur woman. Um, I guess we can start there for people who haven't read the book yet, though they definitely should. Um, what is you know, a day in the life of, of someone um, in Xinjiang right now? Sure. So if you are a resident of Xinjiang, so let's say you are a woman. So you'll wake up in the morning and you will have next to you often a man who is not your partner, not connected to you in any way, but is actually appointed by the government to sleep in your bed. The government rule technically says they have to stay about, I think, three centimeters or three inches apart. There's like a rule that they publish online. <laughs> is, so, is, there a, is there a party official with a ruler there? <laughs> yeah, well, that's, that's, the, that's the whole joke, right? So it's just there's a man in your bed and he sleeps with you. And this is because your, your partner has been taken away, usually to a concentration camp where your partner is being brainwashed and psychologically, physically tortured, told to renounce their entire heritage and language and history and just being molded into a member of the majority ethnic group, which is the Han Chinese. So this man in your bed, appointed by the party, is there for what is called, the party calls it becoming family. That's a literal translation. So We're all going to become one big happy family and we're going to have party spies living in your home who are going to be instructing your kids on how to, you know, honor the party and worship the party, follow the party. And then they're going to sleep in your bed with you because that creates community. It creates trust. It creates a feeling of warmth between the government and the people who are being monitored by the government. So um, that's literally, and this is not any kind of exaggeration, this is literally what has been published in Mandarin Chinese by the government. They see this stuff publicly because they assume that foreigners and other people like journalists are not reading it, um, but actually we are, and people are translating it, gathering evidence and data. So that's just to start your day. It's pretty miserable. You wake up, 
um, you know, I, I don't even want to ask or know what, what happened. I mean, I'm sure there's a lot of sexual assault that goes on in these homes, but then in the morning you'll have breakfast and the party instructor will quiz you on your loyalty to the party, party history. So party law, what, you know, what, what happened in 1950, when was the communist party founded? When did it take over China? And then you'll go through your day being surveilled constantly. So, you know, one of the most common ones I've heard is that if you go to the gas station, there will be all these guards surrounding your car and you'll have to scan an ID card. Your national ID card will say on the, like a little screen is there on the, the gas station, the gas thing, and it'll pop up uh, with a thing that says trustworthy or untrustworthy. And if you are found to be trustworthy, then you can get a tank of gas. If you are found to be untrustworthy, then the guards will surround you and they'll say, okay, so what are you doing here? What are you all about? They'll check your documents, check your smartphone for any suspicious apps or, you know, suspicious religious texts like the Quran, which is especially sensitive being Muslim. And, uh, so, I mean, this, this kind of, you know, daily life will continue, um, throughout the day. So. You will, uh, for example, go to the grocery store. There are cameras watching you. If you buy diapers, your trustworthiness ranking with the government can go up because that means you're a good parent or someone that the state can trust. Um, you know, if you buy a pack of cigarettes or beers or, you know, you play too many video games in your free time, the government will lower your trustworthy ranking because that means that you're a lousy, a lazy person who's not worthy of the, the party's warmth and love and care. So let's say uh, you go to work, you are a Uyghur woman at work, maybe you're a school teacher. So the kids will be instructed to watch you, to spy on you and to see what you say in class. And you will be instructed to spy on them, spy on all the kids. If they say anything that's off kilter or not totally loyal to the party, that's a sign that their parents might be disloyal and you'll be required to report it to the local police station, and then they will go check up on this family and make sure that the, maybe detain them or interrogate parents, make sure that they're trustworthy in some way. I and mean, if they're not, they'll be taken to a concentration camp. So uh, you get where I'm going with this. This is George Orwell. This is Minority Report, Tom Cruise, a minority report for, for everyone who, if, if you haven't seen the movie, it's about these precogs, these humanoid beings that work at this police station. And it's called the pre-crime division. It's in the Department of Justice and it's able to predict murders that will happen in the future. And when these murders are going to happen, the police swoop in and arrest people and take them away and put them in this brainwashing mechanism. Like they're put to sleep in this coma and they're just showed beautiful images of life and humanity in this like sleepy state in a dungeon somewhere or whatever it is. This is what life is like in Xinjiang, China. It is the world's most sophisticated surveillance state. It is a, just a hellish dystopia of Big Brother constantly watching you. And it literally is the incarnation of what the science fiction writers like George Orwell anticipated and predicted. And that's why I wanted to write this book because I had spent a lot of time in this region over the years. I saw this deterioration and I knew that this was going to be significant for humanity, not just for what's happening in China right now, because it shows us how bad things can get if we're not careful with how we govern and manage new technologies. Yeah, the thing I found fascinating in a very disturbing way is that it seems to be the apex, the epitome of every uh, both historical and fictional totalitarian state and, and genocide and the dictatorship that you can imagine. So, you know, you've got the concentration camps, which obviously we've seen in various uh, bits of history, especially in the Holocaust. You've got the Orwellian, you know, the surveillance. You've got the newspeak. You've got the predictive policing of Minority Report. You've got the destruction of culture and history, which you and I saw with the Khmer Rouge in Cambodia. Um, you've got this, this citizen surveillance, which reminded me of, of the Stasi, the way every neighbor is surveilling every neighbor. And you just got everything packed into the one location, um, which makes just even just reading about it incredibly oppressive, right? It feels like there is no escape. There is no expectation of privacy or of, of any respite anywhere. 
Yes. Uh, well, that's exactly what it is. And that's why I wrote this book, because I wanted to give readers a feeling of the human experience, what it's like to live under a system that's so enormously oppressive, even violently oppressive to the point uh, where even, you know, whether you walk into your home through the front door or back door, it'll determine whether or not the state can trust you and whether you'll be taken to a concentration camp. There is a massive artificial intelligence system that operates in Xinjiang. It's, it's uh, relatively new, about three or four years old now, called the IJOP, the Integrated Joint Operations Platform. And this platform gathers mass data, just scoops up everything it can about everyone based on their purchases, their clicks, the apps that they use, you know, the apps send data to the system, police report, court reports, personal histories, employment, camera footage, you know, like it monitors what you're doing every day, where you drive, what your schedule is. If you're sick one day and you're late for work, you better have evidence because it, it'll spot you and the police will show up and ask why you were late for work that day. Is there something amiss here? Is this person planning a terrorist attack? It's a total surveillance system based on artificial intelligence and new advancements in facial recognition and voice recognition that allows the state to become this all-seeing eye in which everyone knows that they're being watched constantly. The only thing is that they're not sure when they're being watched. I mean, they assume that they're always being watched, but you never know if there's a human behind it or if there's a computer, an app behind it or whatever it is. And for any infraction, for anything that you do, it could be so tidy, um, you could be taken to a concentration camp for years and tortured and just have your soul crushed and spirit taken out of you to the point where you deny your own existence, your own reality. You just become this empty robot. This is what the system is designed to do. It's really a modern genocide. And I know I use that word genocide carefully. I mean, th this is under international law. This actually does meet the criteria of genocide. But the difference with what's happening here is that this is a 21st century genocide. This is what happens when you combine the rise of authoritarianism around the world that's happened, you know, everywhere, not just China. It's happened in Russia, um, you know, America for a good time, parts of the European Union. Uh, and you combine it with these advances and new technologies that a lot of us don't fully understand, fully grasp, but that have the enormous potential to be used for good, but also for enormous bad, too. Is the technology that they're using that advanced? Are we, are we talking about things that we can't even imagine that we're not using, you know, in our day to day life on Facebook or, or whatever, in terms of facial recognition, for instance? Is it just a way that it's being used and the fact that it's omnipresent that's making it this dangerous? It's the perception that the technology is advanced. So it's not that the technology itself is necessarily super intelligent. You know, we're not actually dealing with Terminator robots yet. We haven't gotten to the stage, you know, like the, the killer AI that's going to blow up the nuclear bombs. But we are at a stage now where the technology is good enough that we know that it can watch everybody but nobody knows for sure whether it's actually that smart about what it's doing. So in the case of what's happening in China, uh, the evidence from my own interviews, I interviewed technology workers who had actually worked on this tech, and uh, they say that the inner workings are actually not that strong. It's not that, it's not that this technology is pinpointing you know, people and correctly finding terrorists or criminals among a crowd. What it's doing that's so terrifying is that it's assuming that every single correlation between two data points could be evidence of some kind of terrorist suspicious activity. So, you know, like you're wearing a backpack in a crowd while well, the AI saw five other people with backpacks in other crowds across the country. And there's a rise in the number of backpacks today compared to yesterday. Yesterday, the whole region had 30 backpacks and today it has 50 backpacks. So that means that there must be a terrorist attack coming, you know, like there might be a bomb in one of those. So let's, let's arrest everybody who is wearing a backpack, walking around the street, search all backpacks and send them to a camp for a week, just to make sure that they take a loyalty class and just to be sure that their brains will be uh, washed of their viruses. They literally use language like this. They say, we're going to cleanse you of your ideological viruses. We're going to give you a cancer treatment to ensure that the cancer in your mind this terrorist ideology, this dissent inside you will be cured and cleansed and you will be one of us again. You will join our great nation and our great society. Um, 
literally sci-fi language here, just terrifying dystopian stuff. But that is what makes this so terrifying is that it is new technology in the hands of people who want to use it for this purpose. Like it doesn't matter. I mean, they could, you know, they could release anything. They could release like a, a, a metallic elephant and this metallic elephant goes around and they say that it's looking at people and surveilling you, but it's just a dumb, you know, like robot that just walks around. But the point is that people will get scared and people will believe that because they've seen what this government is capable of. And it's not like they have any concerns about false positives or anything. No, no. That's exactly what it is. It's a dragnet campaign. False positives don't matter. Inaccuracies don't matter. It's just sweep up the guilty and the innocent together. And like we can, even if someone's innocent, well, we can still re-educate them and make them loyal, right? What's, mm. what's wrong with that? And this all started as like this massive overreaction to some indeed isolated cases of, of terrorism in, a decade ago in the region. Yes. So the region does have a history of terrorism. So the weaker ethnic minority, they are Muslim. Um, compared to other uh, Sunni and Shia countries, they actually are more moderate on the spectrum of kind of Islamic uh, beliefs around the world. They are Sunnis, but they incorporate a number of kind of pre-Muslim shamanistic practices still. So this is not, you know, we're not talking Saudi Arabia with the Wahhabism and, you know, let's go behead the enemies and all that. Like that, you don't find that a lot in the region of Xinjiang, China, but there is a small contingent of people who have been radicalized. This has been going on since the 1990s mainly, but the war on terror sped this up. A good number of Uyghurs did travel to Afghanistan and later Syria and other hotspots, Turkey, places around the world where they could engage in jihad, ultimately with the goal of returning to China and waging a holy war against China, overthrowing the communist government in Xinjiang and establishing a caliphate. And one of the things they wanted to do was to form this um, Central Asian caliphate in which all the stand countries, Kazakhstan, Western China, Kyrgyzstan would become one giant Islamic you know, nation. Um, obviously that's far-fetched, it's not going to happen. But after there were a series of terrorist attacks in China, including you know an attempted airplane hijacking, there was a train station a stabbing, like all these kinds of things going on. The Chinese government reacted with blunt force. There was no sense of counterinsurgency or like pointed operations at key people and key leaders in this network. It was simply the religion of Islam makes people violent, and therefore we need to respond with a blanket you know, like a carpet bombing, just carpet bomb the whole region, not literally, but carpet bomb it with technology and surveillance and police forces and treat everybody as an enemy until they are proven innocent. So that means everyone's guilty. Anything that's suspicious gets them taken to a concentration camp. And then we'll just kind of sort them out in the end and like, whatever, they'll all be reformed anyway. So it's good for that. We're just developing that when we, you know, do a dragnet approach. We'll be right back. Hey, this is Isabel. I don't know if you're as much of a podcast addict as I am, but I've been listening to them for 15 years and I listen to several every day. And if you pay attention, like I do now, to how they were made, it's fascinating. I love listening to the credits. And if you take a show like The Daily from The New York Times, they spend like two minutes just reading the names of the people who are involved and they just keep getting longer and longer. That's the amount of work that goes into making a podcast. But you know what? Borderline is made by one person. That's it. That's just me. I record, I produce, I interview, I read the books, I talk with people, I edit, I do the social media, the visuals, the distribution, the business side, everything, the newsletter, everything is done by me. So that's more than full-time work. And to support this, I'm inviting you to become a member of Borderline. You can join at borderlinepod.com slash subscribe and become a member. You'll get this podcast a day early without these annoying ads. You'll get access to a Discord community where all global citizens who are listening to Borderline can chat and interact with me and with each other. You'll get transparency into the business and you'll help me keep this going. So if Borderline is even a little bit as meaningful to you as it is to me, becoming a member is the best way that you can keep it going and growing. So go to borderlinepod.com slash subscribe. Thank you so much. And now let's get back to our episode. 
How is the um, the situation in Afghanistan now and the return of the Taliban? Is that going to make China even more, even stricter, sorry, with with uh, the Uyghurs, do you think? So it is hard to tell at this point, but I think there's a chance it might actually be, it, it might actually have no effect because the Uyghur situation has become so extreme already. Short of a full on, you know, violent massacre in which the Uyghurs are just exterminated. I don't think there's much more that the government can do there to, to kind of surveil this region. But the Chinese government has essentially recognized the Taliban. They've signaled that they do want to work with the Taliban, that they're treating them as the legitimate government of Afghanistan. Uh, and then there's also a big question mark now over the Uyghur population in Afghanistan, many of which who actually fought with the Taliban before, is the Taliban just going to repatriate them to China in exchange for good relations or something? And I think that's a, a very um, strong possibility. China is not the priority target for the Taliban. Um, you know, ISIS-K and al the old Al-Qaeda, China was never their main focus. I think they know that they're not going to win many victories in China, like propaganda victories. It's ultimately the secular decadent West in the eyes of the extremists who, you know, we need to blow up bombs in Paris and, and blow up a bomb in Times Square. I think that's more how they think uh, when it comes to finding these symbolic victories that give them loads of propaganda and attract followers. Uh, so I think the more likely thing that's going to happen is that Taliban and China will become a uh, kind of unusual enemy of my enemy is my friend type allies. And I, I think the Taliban is just going to abandon the Uyghurs and just say, all right, thanks for your service, but China wants you back and goodbye. Huh. There hasn't been a lot of solidarity has there been for them, for the Uyghurs in the Muslim world and in, and in the broader world. I, I'm, I'm, I mean, I'm someone who watches the news quite a lot. And I learned a lot in your book. I, you know, I knew there was something going on in, in Xinjiang, obviously, but given the magnitude of what's happening, it's kind of baffling how little we know about it. Yes, it is baffling. Part of the reason is because the Chinese government is really good at keeping a lockdown there. The journalists are regularly detained. Some journalists have been invited, like the BBC. They actually toured some concentration camps. But Apart from a few, you know, well-crafted propaganda tours, the region is on lockdown and no one can actually go there. You can't walk up to a person on the street and ask them what's happening. It's just total terror, total lockdown. You're constantly being watched. And even, you know, when I went there, I was most recently there in December 2017 and I was detained and told to leave. I feel lucky that the authorities did not do more. They could have probably escalated a case against me because I was a journalist on a tourist visa, which is illegal, I mean, terribly illegal in China. They have arrested other people. There are two Canadians, the two Michaels, who are now in a Chinese prison, and they've been there for more than two years awaiting trial. And this stuff happens. Like, there are dangers when you're traveling in regions like this. Um, so, you know, I just think that the situation there doesn't get enough publicity. I wanted to write this book because I wanted to shine a full narrative on it, not just an article, but a start to finish. Like, how did we get here and where is it headed? And I wish more journalists would be writing about this just because it it has so much significance despite its obscurity. I mean, we're, we're seeing in real time the testing laboratory for how to create a perfect authoritarian dystopia. Um, you know, is this going to be rolled out elsewhere? I it's there are already signs that governments in sub-Saharan Africa, Central Asia are using these same technologies now, but no one's really paying attention. And it just makes me wonder, like, one day, are we going to wake up and realize that half the world is using Chinese surveillance technologies and the other half is sanctioning Chinese surveillance technologies? And there's this understanding that if you want to travel, even as a tourist, let's say you're going to Hong Kong or you're going to Kenya or Uganda or somewhere like that, you're being surveilled by China, whereas there's like this free world or this quasi-democratic world of the West and some of the more democratic allies like Japan, where you can feel somewhat safe from watchful eyes, although that's not always true either. It depends on the circumstances. Yeah, it's a troubling question, and that's why I think this topic is important. Mm. I was going to ask, is China... Is this a strictly domestic issue and domestic use of technology, or is it starting to reach out and observe what's happening 
in other places, you know, whether that's in some of their client states in the global south or, or even in uh, more democratic states. Yes. So China has been eager to export this technology. It has been exporting it rapidly, mainly to authoritarian regimes around the world. And these governments, there have been studies done of where the tech is going. They tend to be uh, middle income countries, so not rich, not poor. You know, a good example would be a place like Uzbekistan, which has an authoritarian government. They're just looking for ways to surveil their people better. And so they actually put out a statement and they said they were buying Huawei products. Huawei is a big Chinese smartphone maker. The purpose was to, quote, digitally manage political affairs, unquote. Uh. So that's your Orwellian doublespeak for we're going to spy on our citizens and our dissidents. So Chinese companies will always deny that they are working hand in hand with the Chinese government and the Communist Party. But the reality is that the chances of that being true are just so, so, so slim. And the reason is because under Chinese law, there are two laws, the national security law and the national intelligence law, which were both passed in past five, six years, both essentially make it a crime for anyone who is requested to share intelligence with the Chinese government, a crime to refuse to share it. So if the government comes knocking on your door, goes to a Chinese company like Huawei and says, okay, hand us over all the data you, you've gathered on your servers from everyone in Russia, where we need to look at Russia right now. We want everyone in Moscow and everyone in St. Petersburg. And, you know, we, we can't tell you why, but we just need it. Huawei will essentially be required to turn that over or to be heavily sanctioned and executives could go to jail. We've already seen, I mean, look at what's happening in China now. There have been a series of crackdowns on big tech companies by the Communist Party. Even Jack Ma, who's this, you know, this uh, Elon Musk guy of, of China, this big figure behind Alibaba, one of the biggest IPOs in the century, which made billions and billions of dollars for its shareholders, um, you know, is now on the run and has disappeared. And no one really knows where he is because the Chinese government is cracking down on all these companies. What this signifies is that companies in China, a private enterprise, they don't have power over data. They don't have power over what they're doing. The Chinese government, the party, under the Chinese system, the constitution is the highest law of the land. The party itself supersedes all laws and what the party says goes, and that's that. So, you know, my recommendation, you know, don't use a Huawei phone, don't use Hikvision cameras, avoid Chinese technologies that are on the cloud because you really don't know, unless you're a true tech expert, you have no way of knowing how your data is being used and whether a communist party spy is looking at it. Have we been too naive? And by we, I mean the, the people that rule us, really. Have we been too naive in, in letting it get to this stage and letting Chinese technology and Chinese companies have such an imprint on our lives? Yes. Well, what we're seeing now is the uh, consequences of two decades, three decades even, of naivety over um, free trade and the free market. There was once a belief after the Cold War ended and the Berlin Wall fell, that if we place our trust in globalization, if we open the markets, sign the trade treaties, create NAFTA, the chorus FTA, all these Chinese deals, China joins the WTO, for example, that was a big one. The market will sort itself out and we are going to see a flourishing of democratic principles and human rights around the world, that the markets predate the human rights. What we're realizing now worldwide is that it's actually the opposite, that democratic principles and democratic values predate the ability to have a functioning market that works in everyone's uh, interests. What has happened is that by preaching these false principles of the free market, China has managed to convince the world that it needs to put all of its manufacturing in China put all of its business there, create all these links, like we're going to manufacture your special IP, your intellectual property that's super secret, and we promise we won't steal it. And now we, we find ourselves in this um, really difficult situation where Western companies are dependent on these Chinese supply chains, which are just, I mean, littered and just filled with slave labor, forced labor, human rights abuses of all kinds. And now major firms in the West 
have just been just crapping their pants because they realize like how much of this slave labor they've been involved in. A lot of it coming out of Xinjiang. Cotton, it's one of the world's biggest producers of cotton, relies on Uyghur slave labor. A lot of the components in our smartphones, uh, our you know, semiconductors have been made with Uyghur slave labor throughout China. Even Apple had to reportedly drop a supplier, one of the components for the iPhone, because it, it was found to have uh, slave labor. It was employing slave labor. But this is a terrifying prospect because we don't know how deep this rot goes. And now it's, we can't divorce ourselves from China because they have so much of our IP. They have so many American and European factories are based there. And it's like, once you try to take all that out of China, well, China retaliates and they punish companies, you know, they sanction them. They organize uh, boycotts, like don't buy the Gap, don't buy this clothing line, like the, this American clothing line, they're opposed to China. So th we were now in this situation in the world where it's become either or. You either have to choose, you're on the side of the Americans and the Five Eyes and the Europeans, or you're on the side of China and its allies. And that's the irony to it. Like we thought we would go into this historical story coming out all benefiting, all more democratic. But in the process, we've actually created this line that exists where it's really just one or the other, and it really is a new Cold War. With the major difference, that the, the classic Cold War, you had two blocks that just kind of lived their own lives, right? And now you have an incredibly interlinked economic system where the two blocks really cannot exist independently. Yes, and that's the dangerous aspect of this is that if this Cold War were to heat up, the devastation to the world and the economy, the prosperity that we've seen in the world since the past, in the, since the 1980s, you know, it's been a very prosperous time for certain groups of people, not everyone, but all that is just going to be wiped away if there's an actual war between China and the U.S. I don't see any way that businesses and big financial institutions are going to be able to escape just the ripple effects of, you know, like we can't work with China at all anymore. And this is the weakness. I think the lesson that we've learned is that you know, even in a world that's become very globalized, national power is still deeply important. The sovereignty of a nation and the idea that a nation is accountable to its citizens above all else and not just accountable to one party or to one dictator. I think that there was a lot of idealism that with the with these free market principles, we could change places like they would the middle class would find democracy and they would change their governments to become more democratic. But it's totally the opposite. It's what happens is that authoritarian governments find ways to keep power using the money coming in, using using their newfound economic clout that gives them leverage over their people. Mm. So it's the end of that that liberal free market utopia. It's also the end of techno utopianism, right? Like the idea that the internet will save us and that a free open exchange of information through technology would, would liberalize the world, right? That's not happening. No, it's not happening. And it's it has advanced society in many ways, I think, in terms of the information that we have available to us at any moment. But we've also regressed in so many ways. And it's not just what's happening with China and the U.S., but look at the just the, the political um, chaos of the past five, six years with the, the rise of these populists and the, the bad actors on Twitter, the propaganda, just all the bad information that gets out there. We've yeah, you know, I think that what's happened is that we've been asked to lean in to all these Silicon Valley firms. They always used to say that, remember, like Sheryl Sandberg, hey, lean in. Mm -hmm. We're looking out for you. We're, look at how cool we are. We're changing the world. But what we forgot is that these companies are self-interested entities and their job as inscribed in the very principles and laws of Western democracies is to make a profit for themselves and for their shareholders. It's a model that is fundamentally flawed because it soaks up national resources, national, uh, you know, the nation's money and finances. It's soaking them up into these private companies. And then before you know it, they have enormous um, influence, you know, over you. Like you're not, the, the government is not calling the shots anymore. It's the company that's calling the shots. And one good example of that is uh, just recently Amazon used its leverage to bully the National Security Agency into awarding it a contract. I mean, they were competing for all these contracts and Amazon just said, give it to us or else we're going to screw you. And the NSA relented and said, okay. Also, Australia was going to pass laws that would curtail Facebook in the country. 
And Facebook just said, okay, if you act against us, we're just going to pull Facebook from your country. That shows how much power they have, because I imagine an entire nation without Facebook now, it's like turning off the electrical grid and it's like there's chaos and no one can reach their families. And, and you know, like, it would just be, it, it would just be devastating for a while. I, I guess people would adjust to it eventually, but just this, it's like we live in an age now where we just need social media and we need technology. That's an interesting mirror image of um, of the Chinese Communist Party telling Huawei what to do. We kind of have the reverse the reverse situation. I want to. I'm going to resist the temptation to end on. Uh, you know, tell me something hopeful. <laughs> That's my years in Silicon Valley. You know, which which I'm trying to cure myself from. But do tell me what can be done. You know, we have this this pretty scary diagnostic. Where do we start in, in trying to reverse these trends? Yes. Yeah, so there is so much work that needs to be done and it's hard to even say which steps are going to lead to success and which steps are going to, you know, fail or just be useless. The various governments have been implementing all these sanctions against Chinese technology. That's a good first step, but that is like putting a bandaid on this deeper problem about how our global financial system has been structured. The financial system that we live in it's self-interested, it's catered towards its own interests and its own needs for its own profits and not for the good of communities and nations at large. That's what we, we've realized. So one example of a major problem is um, the rise of these global kleptocracies that enable human rights abuses. And when I say kleptocracy, I mean a government that robs from its people and that takes resources and wealth and oppresses them. And all these global kleptocracies, this is Putin, this is China, this is Ukraine, certain people in Ukraine, Congo, they stash their money in offshore accounts in the Cayman Islands, the British Virgin Islands, sometimes even the state of Delaware in the U.S., in certain Western states of the U.S., in Monaco, all these places. There is a massive problem of money laundering. About one quarter of global tax revenues are estimated to be lost. So money laundering, this is a way for certain countries to seal the tax revenues that are owed to other countries. That, that It's like undercutting other nations. And this is like, whenever I bring this up, people wonder, how does this connect to human rights in Xinjiang or human rights anywhere in the world? And the thing is that the people who put their money in these offshore jurisdictions, what they're doing is they're hiding their human rights abuses. They, they have a shell company open. And let's say they go to Myanmar and they work with the military to extract oil using slave labor. Well, you know, that money, it's not going to stay in Myanmar. They're going to put it in the Cayman Islands because no one asks questions there. So I think that the system needs to change. I think that governments need to start sanctioning offshore jurisdictions. They need to clean up their own tax laws. I do think that here in the States, the IRS, many people would disagree, but they, I think they do need more power than they have. They need more resources. Um, to go after the ultra rich. And I think that as we start to sew up these like open gaping holes in the international financial kind of capitalist order, that's going to solve a good deal of the problems when it comes to financing human rights abuses worldwide. You know, it's not going to solve everything, but reforming the system itself is, I think, ultimately is the, the deeper problem here. Thanks so much. This was eye-opening, and I know listeners will appreciate it. Great. Thanks, Isabel.